it's a specific thing. You can prove that you have the thing and it gives you access to that information or to that thing in the real world. It's, it's as thingy as something that is not a thing can get. Um, <laughs> You're going to edit that, right? <laughs> no, don't edit it. Hey. That was great. That was great. Today we'll be covering how a hacker can easily get your texts just by rerouting your SMS messages, reasons why not to hang out on public Wi-Fi, and how hackers are selling their cybersecurity exploits as non-fungible tokens. Welcome to another episode of Bourbon and Data Breaches, where we cover one of our favorite bourbons and the top five most interesting data breaches of last week. I'm Nikki. I'm Michael. Howdy, I'm Shu. It is just us three while we cover today's topics on uh, Wednesday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. I am wearing a little bit of green. Mike is wearing a little bit of green, a lot of green. Shu, staying true to his colors. I wear maroon always. All that. Topic number one we'll be covering. It's brought to us by The Verge. A hacker who exposed Verkata's surveillance camera snafu has been raided. Tilly Cotman, 21-year-old hacker, self-proclaimed hacktivist, was raided by Swiss authorities, or their devices were seized. This wasn't the hack that led authorities to go and get them. This was this hacker had been leaking data for a while, and they basically just caught up to him now. One of the most recent ones was basically a breach um, that had given access to over 150,000 to the of the cam of the company's cameras to see inside schools, jails, hospitals, police stations, and Tesla factories. That's a weird sandwiching of Tesla in there, but there it is. Um, what did you guys see in this breach? Snafu seems like a pretty light way to describe what happened. You know, co companies that need to be HIPAA compliant have uh, very much relied on Verkata for video surveillance. So you you named some of the some of the facilities involved, including, you know, prisons, including women's prisons and psychiatric facilities, uh, places where you would not want uh, footage leaked, um, where it would be, you know, sensitive for the people that run those facilities and, you know, the people that inhabit those facilities. So that's a pretty tough breach for Snafu. It's interesting. The article here, it's, uh, he wasn't busted for that though. He was busted, uh, he, because of the Vercada breach, he got the attention of authorities, and then they said, oh, you've been doing these other things. One of them is probably illegal. The article speculates it has to do with Intel, um, but he was basically passing around leaked data. So um, they got him on that. And um, what I find interesting is uh, this is not the first time that law enforcement, that a hacktivist or cybersecurity professional has gotten the attention of law enforcement for doing something good. And then they get the, sh the spotlight shown on them. And then they say, oh, you've been doing these things that are a little gray. We'll try to, uh, we'll try to get you on those. So um, we can talk about the wisdom of that, whether it's really helpful to try to bust people that are helping helping law enforcement, but also um, also speaks volumes about how data is released and maybe a little, 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 little bit about Hacknos and what we're doing. Well, that it's really tough to pass around that, um, that data though. The, the footage was extremely sensitive and it's been passed around the web for the past couple of weeks, uh, you know, in various places. This, this guy just happened to be some of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it seems like uh, related to previous hacks that we've covered with Parler and Gab, you have hacktivists that are collecting information and just either keeping it, storing it, making sure it just like doesn't get wiped off the earth for whatever reason. Here's a big difference though. If you were on Parler, two things. First, you opted into Parler. You chose to use Parler as a service. And second, uh, Parler didn't protect you by say obfuscating your geolocation you know, if you, if you posted it and you left that on, if you're an inmate at uh, a women's prison, for example, where they used Verkata uh, for their surveillance cameras, I mean, you didn't opt into using Verkata. You didn't choose them as the, you know, the security camera that they would use at the, at the prison you're in, or if you were in a psychiatric 
facility. You didn't opt in to using Verkata. Just it happened that their systems were hacked and now there's footage of you doing whatever you were doing. And that's, I mean, that's a big no, no, you can't just pass that stuff around. So it's, it's not just a failure on, in terms of the service provider, you never opted into that service. So it's, it's particularly tough. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't rate it on the same level as the, the parlor metadata getting passed around. Good point. I, yeah, I think you raised a good point with the Vicada. I think this arrest can potentially lead to a lot of other civil lawsuits for, for Cicada. We probably have not heard the, uh, the last from this guy. Um, but yeah, I think it does raise interesting issues on how companies like Hacknotice release their data. Our job is to notify so that if you've given data to another company or to a third party, or you share a network connection with them, you can quickly respond and examine the data that you've turned over, examine that network connection and make sure you secure yourself in a timely fashion, but not to, not to release the actual breach data. Correct. Yeah, main point. Main point is that you're just not sitting blind thinking everything is going fine when your information is just spreading like wildfire. Topic number two we'll be covering comes from Vice. Headline reads, a hacker got all my texts for $16. We've shared Vice articles before and it's simply because it's just good uh, storytelling, I guess, with folks getting into it and sharing their personal experiences. Um, this reporter had essentially done a favor for their friend. Their friend was a researcher who said, hey, I can steal your text. And he said, okay, go ahead. Let's see what happens and I can do a story on it. Uh, $16 later, it's, it is what it is and it shows how uh, easy it is for hackers who want to get this kind of information in their hands. What are your thoughts? One of the one of the things that we've covered on the show before is that things like two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication are a best practice, but they're not a, a panacea. They don't, they don't cure everything. Um, and this is, this is one of the reasons why. It's because a lot of users opt in to an SMS code, and those are very easily intercepted, uh, as we can see. So, you know, no one's saying that two-factor, multi-factor is not a best practice. It is, but it's, it's not reliable, especially if in the form of some kind of SMS message going to a user because you see how easily they were, they were intercepted. Yeah, this is another attack on uh, phone-based two-factor authentication. Uh, we are seeing that it is weakening through attacks. This is not SIM jacking. It is actually much easier than SIM jacking. Um, according to the article, it was basically a lot of, um, it was mostly social engineering. So, um, you're completely right. Uh, two-factor authentication is not the end-all be-all and phone-based two-factor authentication the industry is going to have to find a uh, alternative to phone-based two-factor auth authentication very soon. It pointed out that uh, this said hacker had signed up for a service which a lot of companies want to use for marketing purposes in terms of texting users or people who subscribe and say, yes, I'd like to get these notifications. And the stick up was um, a hacker had signed up for the service. And I don't know, like the, the, the main points where it connects, basically all that that service had asked was, is this list your list? And did they say yes? And he's basically like, yep, they totally agreed to it. So go ahead and you know, let me have messages and get them messages however you want. But I am basically just going to take all these text messages, text messages and use them however I see fit. But we had mentioned how now there's a bunch of companies that are coming up in the digital age. They can do any service that they want, but there's no hard breaks on them. And there's no real governance because you don't know what a company is going to do. Is this just one of those situations coming to light in this story? I think down the road, um, companies are going to react once they once it's exposed that they actually have to answer for their actions too. Um, but uh, but yeah, until we get there, there's going to be people hurt by this. The, the paradigm in the United States is we introduce something new, we see what the effects or ramifications are of it, and then eventually we put into legislation. We we enact legislation that hopefully stops the bad part. 
or at least or at least the worst part right so bad you know, has we, to happen first but it ha the, but yeah. the bad ha but the bad has to happen first because that's that's part of how our system perpetuates itself if there's um some new business that's going to start up and is marketing directly to people's phones and is using sms messages to do it they're going to run rampant until uh until they get hemmed in and then you know hemmed in just by the limits of the law and then of course they'll find other innovations or, or ways around that and that's you know how it works in in every industry but that's how it works in the data industry as well we talked about um the drizzly acquisition right so drizzly was breached but ultimately because they created a, a sustainable user base they were bought by uber you know for a similar reason if you're not driving for uber but you're sitting in your car you can be making alcohol deliveries it's a very natural marriage so the question is do you do you frame the story well they got breached and you know something bad happened as they were broadening their their user base and they still got bought for a million or was it you know they could have been uh, a billion or they could they have been bought for three billion you know and the breach cut the cost you know to a third we do we don't really know but it's it's clear that especially where building audiences is is concerned that is much more remunerative than worrying about any uh potential legal ramifications or financial ramifications down the road you know you you shoot first and you ask questions later Okay, well, now is a good time for a bourbon break. And today is a little special because it's St. Patty's Day. I got a bottle of Powers, which I mistakenly thought was a small, unknown Irish whiskey company that lets you know that I don't know whiskey at all. That's, that's, the, whiskey, that's the whiskey that the Irish drink. Is natural instinct. I'm basically Irish today. There you go. <laughs> I've never even heard of Powers. Really? Yeah, I've never. Yeah. That's, you do look surprised. I said that. Yeah, that's like the whiskey standard in Ireland. Really? Huh. Yeah. I mean, like you know, Jameson is the most famous Irish whiskey here, and a lot of Irish people do drink Jameson. But if you're looking for like well whiskey in in Ireland, it's Powers. Get the fuck out! I should go to Ireland one day. <laughs> I'm also drinking drink? Irish whiskey. I'm drinking Tullamore Dew, but with a rum cask finish. Interesting. Really nice. Oh, wow. Almost done with the bottle. So um, this is what I will be finishing later. I've had Tullamore Dew, Tullamore Dew, um, and it is, it is spicy, man. Does the rum cask finish add sweetness to it? How does it change it? It does. It has a really nice finish. Um, you know, I, I think rum tends to be a little bit too sweet for me. I certainly don't drink it straight. I, you know, I might have it in a Cuba Libre or something. Um, but having the Talmore Dew whiskey uh, in with the rum cask finish is nice and warm and sweet. What do you got, Shu? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm still nursing this bottle of Bib and Tucker for the third week, <laughs> which I think tells we you. that episode 14? Episode 15. We covered this a while ago, um, so I guess uh, that fact that the fact that it's still at my desk should say a lot about this this bourbon. You're stretching that sixty dollar bottle. That's what you're doing. Special occasions. Sixty dollars. I wish it was sixty dollars. God damn. Your taxes made it a lot higher. <laughs> at least ten dollars higher. I want to say it was seventy two, but I could be wrong. Excellent. Yeah. That's a round trip flight from Austin, to Colorado. Mm hmm No kidding. All right. Not this week. How do you like Not powers, Nick? So powers, powers, I I uh after I got home, I looked up the bottle because I was like, this is a very unassuming bottle that I've never seen. Because Jameson just dominates everywhere, you know. It's this is actually pretty good. It's um it's very it tastes like sweet oatmeal. And it doesn't bite as much as Jameson. Uh, when I had done the research right before the episode, Jameson and Powers, Powers is so big that they actually teamed up with Jameson and they have their distillery in Dublin. So when people go do the, like the tour, they're more than likely going to hit this up too at the same time. Because, um, But it's sweet. It's a, uh, it's a great beginner whiskey, I guess, because the only whiskeys I like are all tended to be categorized as beginner whiskeys. Um, and I just have it on ice. It's, it's a it's a pleasant, it's a pleasant slow drink on a crazy, on a usually crazy holiday. So 
welcome that. Back to the breaches. Breach number three we'll be covering. Headline reads, what hacker can see when you connect to them on public Wi-Fi. Uh, essentially, a TikTok user had hopped on and said, hey, you shouldn't be doing anything too detailed on public Wi-Fi. It's stupid, and I'll show you why. He brought his own Wi-Fi provider. He set up a fake uh, name. So he went to a Starbucks. He listed the Wi-Fi as free Starbucks Wi-Fi. And in real time from his iPad was showing, <laughs> he decided to show his TikTok viewership, everything that he saw. Um, I am more and more with you guys learning that I should just never use Wi-Fi. That is not anything that I pay for. Where do you think people are very misled in terms of, because if you're going somewhere like on vacation, you're like, oh, where's, can I use your Wi-Fi? Where's the library? You know, like, can you expound on that? Give details. Why shouldn't people be doing that? Uh, because this is an attack that is old as time. Uh, to answer your question, uh, anything that says free, yeah, be wary of anything that says free. Um, because there is a chance that it is a trap and any, doesn't matter if it's SSL, uh, if you're connecting to a site that, that, is, uh, that has a little padlock on it, um, because you're on someone's hotspot, they'll be able to intercept you and capture your data. So uh, this is not secure. Uh, either get a VPN or um, run your own VPN if you are technical. But yeah, this this has been going around for decades now, literally decades. So this is not anything new. Uh, maybe it's new because it's on TikTok and it it acts it, it reaches a, a different audience. Um, but yeah, this is don't connect to public Wi-Fi unless you have some sort of protection. Yeah, this is just self self evident by now. I mean the. That's all I have. It is all yeah. evident by now. If this is still going on, there's a lot of people that are going into a public space and, oh, I wonder if I can mooch off the of Wi-Fi because I don't want to pay the extra overages on my plan or whatever. Like that will save me twenty bucks, not knowing that it can cost me thousands of dollars if somebody were to decide to just take all their information down and really take advantage of it. So I think that's yeah. always a story that comes up. Mike, do you use a VPN for uh, remote access? That I do. Yeah, see, uh, remote VPN. Like we, I, I think you could find some services for like six bucks a month or something like that. If you're doing something important, if you're connecting to work, your work network or something, uh, you need to take advantage of that. Um, I use a service called WireGuard connected to a Raspberry Pi so that all my connections look like they're coming from my home, uh, regardless of where I am. Um, but yeah, don't banking, work stuff, anything at all important. Don't do it over public Wi-Fi unless you are protected. Only safe thing to do on public Wi-Fi is to just scroll through Instagram if you're already logged in. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, well, with the amount of tracking that websites do these days, even that's not like entirely secure. I mean, you used to have to be aware of what you're giving up and if you're okay with that. Fair enough. Don't forget people on Instagram that have accepted you have said, essentially, I only want Nikki or I only want you to see this or people in, in my network. So if you let someone basically browse over your shoulder, you know, you, you've let the world into stuff that's potentially private. Right. I don't want to see your nudes, Nikki. Never again. And that one yeah. time and never again, I'll tell you that. Let's move on to topic number four. A hacker was selling a cybersecurity exploit as an NFT. Then OpenSea stepped in. Um, I glanced over this and read as much as I could before I just realized NFT stands for non-fungible token, and it's a Bitcoin investment. 
you can basically buy parts of the internet what's going on here and someone had basically sold their breach and said hey i got into this place um i feel like it's kind of a piece of art or something that should be remembered you can buy this piece of history am i completely wrong there or uh am i close can we <laughs> figure out what went on in this article no it sounds like you're spot on i have a feeling that Steve probably knows more about this. Than I bet you he's bought some NFTs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He he probably has has been involved in some transactions. Um, the fact that it is selling a zero day on OpenSea NFT is nothing new. Is nothing new. The fact that they're selling an exploit is nothing new. We've seen selling of exploits of zero zero days and exploits left and right. Probably the most famous case is the shadow brokers where. Uh, CIA zero days were auctioned off. Um, I think the only thing really new on this is that it was conduct it was conducted on OpenSea. Um, but uh, but yeah, there are zero days out there. There's a lot of them, and they're being auctioned off on all sorts of platforms, not just OpenSea. And taking advantage of how cool and nifty NFTs are right now. Mm -hmm. As as this is probably. As NFTs are going to be prevalent for a month, two months, however long you think, are there other ways that you think that they can be exploited or uh, used in a similar situation? Um, if somebody is selling a zero day, what other elements of cybercrime are there that can p potentially open up? Anything. I mean, there's there's NFT albums, there's NFT trading cards, there's NFT uh, concert tickets, right? An NFT concert ticket is different than buying, you know, a, an access pass to something at as a, uh, you know, at a music uh, festival or something like that. It's it's a specific thing. You can prove that you have the thing, and it gives you access to that information or to that thing in the real world. It's it's as thingy as something that is not a thing can get. So it can be anything. It can be packaged information. It can be, you know, in the case of an exploit, the information of how to carry out the attack. Uh, it could be the result of the attack. As you said, it could be the record of the of the attack, which I don't think is, is what it was in this case, but it, it could be in the future. It could be the proof. As professionals that work within security have many years under your belt, um, the the path to nfts would you say we're in blockchain and it's because of blockchain that you're able to do this sort of item that always has a traceable record meaning it can't be distorted or changed or modified and we, that's what makes it so valuable we've crossed the chasm to the extent that it's obviously in the mainstream news um you know NFT art was just sold for about seventy million dollars, um, so it's it's gaining public awareness. It's not to the extent that the general public is pumping their money into into NFTs or cryptocurrency. The same people that jumped aboard cryptocurrency as early adopters are getting aboard other kinds of of NFT now. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I think I've learned everything I could about non-fungible tokens. Move on to topic number five. Guns.com, a U.S.-based gun shop, was breached at the end of 2020 and had its database and backend dumped. I found a more recent article that had basically listed out what type of information was listed about every user in this case, and it goes full names, email address, physical address, uh, bank name, account type. Uh, it, it's pretty deep because to buy a gun, it's easy, but you do need um, pieces of information that give a lot of data about you. Uh, you guys looked at this story as it is unfolding. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, okay, to cover the basics, first, they got passwords most you know there's at least a 65 to 70 percent instance of of password reuse uh over multiple services so you can guess that 
the passwords that were exposed for guns.com belong to the those email addresses and users, probably still, probably across most of the services that they use, unless that person is unusually security conscious um, above and beyond you know, what you'd call your normal consumer. The other problem is for connecting synthetic identities. So sometimes hackers are passing around records where all they have is say like a first and last name and a state. That's not super helpful until a record like this comes out, which is basically a cross reference for that other list, you know, of, and you can, start to, you can start to use those files in conjunction with one another to tell, okay, you know, um, M Smith is actually Matthew Smith and he's this Matthew Smith that owns this bank account. And so sometimes there's records floating out there that are quite comprehensive, but all they're missing are one or two elements to become really useful. And then you get a nice rich database like this, uh, which, which, and which would enable an attacker much more information than is, is just available on the guns.com in conjunction with other stuff that's floating out there. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, this, uh, I believe Miguel, uh, Miguel took a look at that. We do have the data and it was, Miguel said that we initially didn't grab it because it was too small. It wasn't a lot of data that was leaked, but the, uh, like you said, Mike, the type of data is just invaluable because, because it was so detailed. So um, this one's tough uh, about, I'm reminded of a leak of an alleged leak probably about 12 years ago uh, in Australia when their national gun registry was allegedly leaked. And they think that it was because um, there was a rash of people that had guns stolen in Australia. Um, so this is, besides just the type of information that was leaked, this is uh, politically sensitive, of course. Um, and um, so yeah, this, you become a target if you're on this list. So it's hard to, for something like this, it's easy to say, I'm on a gun forum, I'm going to use a fake name, fake address and things like this. But uh, guns.com was a marketplace. You had to put your real address in there. So um, you should be kind of careful, not only of the type of information that you're, you're releasing, but also whether you should be on this in the first place because there are ramifications. Yeah, is it fair to say that this latest leak is essentially, it could be a puzzle piece into a, a long con attack where somebody's like, well, we have a ton of information. A lot of it's kind of all over the place and we just need like a really good, rich database to where we'll be able to cross out if there's any you know, overlap or if we can, it, it, I'm not a data guy, so I'm interested to know like what kind of hair stand back up on the back of your head shoe when you see this and you're like, oh, if, if I were collecting all this weird information on people <laughs> and I got this, I'll be able to figure out this and this and this and I can you're, go and- You're a data you guy, right? You're a data guy, Rich. It, well, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not super broad, right? You have to select into guns.com, but it is very deep if you look at what they had. And so- if you put that together with other potentially useful files, if you're going to hack somebody, you know, maybe ones that are broad, they cover, you know, 20% of the U S population, but it's just first name, last name, state, date of birth or something like that. But you put it together with these folks, it might just give you enough to, to perpetrate something really bad against these particular individuals. And what, as Shu mentioned, you know, most hacking, most cybercrime is financially motivated. There is a, a slight flavor here, though, where you know some of the some of the hacks against people who own, for example, high-powered automatic weapons, um, and bought them kind of just because they can. Uh, some of that could be politically motivated, particularly in the United States. Yeah, um, I wasn't on Guns.com, but uh, <laughs> like we said on the, on the no, no, really. S sister uh, site flamethrowers.com yeah yeah just for flamethrowers um but like we talked about the last episode uh with china rumors to be creating a huge database you really something like guns.com china knows you owns gun you own guns now so yeah well yeah i think uh i think that really wraps it up there is not much we can do except for being on top of the information we put out onto the internet the world wide web. 
the crazy thing that keeps on spinning. Don't trust uh, the companies that you give your data to and know what you're giving up. And sign up for a service like Hack Notice. At least know what hackers know about you, what's out there, what's exposed, what they could use against you, what you can do about it. Um, this has been another episode of Bourbon Data Breaches. If you liked the topics we covered, uh, let us know in the comments. If you hated them, let us know in the comments. If you have bourbon recommendations, put them in the comments. You could also put any of your uh, ideas or your thoughts in a nice little message and send it to contact at hacknotice.com. Um, but Thanks for joining, everyone. Uh, until next time. Happy St. Patrick's Day.